know you guys have seen a lot of NASA people today, and you're going to see a little bit more folks right now. And this is segueing a little bit off of what Clayton did this morning. So he gave a great overview on the Artemis mission, where we're going, Moon, Mars. You guys, we've got a lot that we've got to do. And I think he conveyed really clearly that we are not doing this alone. We need you guys. And so really why we did this panel was really for y'all. It's for us too, but we wanna make sure that you guys have a little bit more understanding of the on-ramps and how you can partner with us. So one of the, you know, two of the big things I kind of want to accomplish today in this and then in a networking session we have after is one, how do we make ourselves more accessible? What are the different partnerships? You guys hear tons about SBIRs. You hear tons about perhaps Space Act agreements, but we have all kinds of innovative ways in which you can partner with us that are tailored, but that same innovation can kind of be really confusing too. So I think we kind of want to shed light on that. We want you guys to hear from us on how we, you can best partner for us. But I know that the, the title of this panel is a little bit weird, making NASA accessible, what does that mean? But again, that is so that we can kind of open up the doors, have educate you guys a little bit on these partnerships. And I will be self-admit that sometimes partnering with us can be confusing. Sometimes it's even hard for me with how large our agency is to know, okay, well, who's got this technology? Where is it? Sometimes we've got it at three different centers because they're all working different TRL levels. So again, you know, there is a, an element of confusion, but we, what we kind of want to serve here is be connectors for you guys. Who I have here are folks from each one of our core research centers as well as from headquarters. The reason we started with just three centers and we've got 10 field centers. So yeah, we could have 10 people up here, but then that would be here two hours and I wanna do that to you guys. Core research centers really have a lot of our tech dev, a lot of our core R&D. And that's kind of a lot of what a lot of you new space companies are really looking at and looking to partner with us on. So starting, let me introduce our panel real quick and then we're gonna get started on some questions. We've got Marla Perez Davis. So she is our deputy director from Glenn Research Center. We have Dan Lockney, and so he is representing headquarters, STMD, Space Technology Mission Directorate. And he is a PE for technology transfer. Again, that's another one of the areas in which you can partner with us on the transfer. We've got Harry Partridge. He's our chief technologist from Ames Research Center, not too far south from here. And then I think you have heard from Clayton. So Clayton Turner has joined us back up here on the stage. He's Deputy Director of Langley. So again, before we kind of get started here, I just want you guys to, you know, we wanted to make this a little bit more conversational. The stage kind of makes it a little bit odd that way. But again, questions and answers from you guys, things that perhaps you haven't had answered from us, please do. We're gonna start out with kind of a set questions that kind of might set the foundation on this. But again, I wanna emphasize the fact, just the we on this, right? We are doing this together. Clayton talked about this this morning. We cannot do what we need to do and get ourselves to the moon, whether it's the Artemis mission, whether it's building large aperture telescopes out in space. We need the technology that you guys have, just like you guys need us. So let's work together and please uh, think of questions when we get to we'll open up to the audience here after we have some of the set questions. All right, but to start out with, I'm gonna give each one of them five minutes to talk technologies. And so they're gonna kind of go overviews on, Dan will talk headquarters, the other folks will talk what's going on at the research centers, and that'll give you insight on some of the core capabilities. I know one of the questions I get, or one of the, the, the amazing, people get amazed sometimes when we talk about everything I know we do at Langley. And I always get that question, like, wow, I had no idea that Langley does all of that. And I know these centers do it too. So again, it's just five minutes, but it's gonna give you guys a little bit of insight on what each one of these centers are doing. So we will start out with Glenn Research Center. And you are welcome to do it from there or at the podium. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I was going to do it from the seat, but then I'm blocking. I cannot see anyone in this corner, so I decided to stand up. Well, there's not too much of a difference. Um, well, NASA Glenn um, Research Center is located in Cleveland, Ohio. I don't know how many of you have visited um, our center, but um, we differentiate ourselves in terms of developing cutting edge technologies for both space and aeronautics. And I'm just going to talk very briefly about what is going on, and then I have a short video that kind of put everything together. So we have two campuses, the main campus, which is near the airport, um, houses 3,100 employees, uh, contractors and civil servants, and uh, is also the home of the majority of the wind tunnels, also the uh, test rig, and a number of uh, very unique facilities. Plumbrook, which is um, around one hour away in Sandusky, Ohio, 
is the uh, home of one of the most powerful space environmental test facility. That's um, the place where we're going to take um, part of Artemis 1. We're going to be testing the um, um, spacecraft. It's coming to uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and we're going to do environmental testing on that facility. So today at Glenn, we're supporting our nation's Artemis exploration effort by developing and testing critical flight hardware that will help land the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. We're leading the uh, Orion European Service Module, as I indicated. We also lead the solar electric portion, which is the proportion of choice, and some of you have heard that this is the first element uh, for the uh, Lunar Gateway program. So we do have the power and proportion element development at Glenn. We also lead in the development of a kilo power, which is a safe, affordable, and reliable efficient power system that can enable long duration stays on the moon. Uh, we also work in fluid physics, um, combustion, and uh, fluid racks for International Space Station and countermeasures to uh, help uh, for the health of our astronaut. I will not, um, I will be remiss if I don't mention our role in um, aeronautics. Uh, we are also leading uh, engineizing and uh, better space, uh, space uh, aircraft. Uh, we also develop and test hybrid electric propulsion and power system that improve uh, future passenger aircraft efficiency while reducing emission costs and noise. And uh, we also are home of uh, the, uh, a very unique NASA electric aircraft test bed which will be used um, to test all the concept for electric aircraft, or electrifying aircraft. And we have the 9x15, we did some modification, and right now is one of the quietest acoustic wind tunnels in the world. Um, with that, what I would like to do is just run the video that kind of uh, put all these things together in terms of what we do also in materials and structure, communication, and power.
right, is my second mic working? Yeah. All right, good. Um, all right, now we're going to hear from Dan Lockney. He's going to tell us a little bit more about the technology transfer program uh, run out of headquarters. Thanks. So. Uh, I'm Dan Lockney out of NASA headquarters. I run the tech transfer activity. Uh, if you don't know what that is, you, you do know what it is, even if you don't know it's called that. If you think back to, you know, NASA gets credit for all these things we invented, like Tang, Teflon, and Velcro, that's tech transfer. Although we didn't actually do Tang, Teflon, or Velcro. But we have done a bunch of other cool stuff, like the camera in your cell phone was one of our inventions. A lot of medical technology, safety devices, every aircraft you've ever been on, it's all got NASA technology in it everywhere. And one of the um, kind of fun and new and exciting things for us is typically in the history of the, of the NASA, um, <laughs> in the history of NASA, we haven't had a commercial space industry to transfer these things to. We we're always looking for non-aerospace applications for these technologies because there wasn't, there wasn't a space industry. But now you guys are here, and boy, do we have a bunch of cool technology for you. Um, and one of the, the, the themes of this panel is that we're trying to learn to, to, to work more with industry and to think more like industry. We don't know how to do that yet. We're trying to get better. Um, but one of the things we've been trying to do within tech transfer is something we all know how to do, and that's think like consumers. Uh, we all buy things, and we all, we all shop for things, and, um, and we all use the internet. So one of the things we've been trying to do in tech transfer is to make sure that our technology portfolios are all online that they're easy to navigate, that if you're interested in something, you can reach out to somebody and get more information. You can find the information yourself. Um, if you're interested in licensing from us or accessing some of our software, we have automated, simple tools for you to, for you to get that stuff. So we're, and, we're, and we've standardized it across all 10 field centers so that you don't get the, the different experience when you go to Stennis or Glenn or Langley. Um, and we are trying to, um, uh, to improve. And um, I, I distributed propaganda uh, to each of you. Each table has uh, little cards on it. Um, and that, that's from me. It's a little gift. You can take that home with you. For, suitable for framing. Um, and <laughs> what we're doing is, we're, uh, is a study of how NASA can pr improve its intellectual property policies and processes in order to better serve this community. So some of the topics would include things like um, uh, invention disclosure. If you're a small business and you work with us and we give you a small amount of money, like say through an SBIR, and then you have to go through this process of, of reporting your invention. We want to make sure that's painless for you and that you also know why you're doing it and what the advantages are to you. If you try to license from us, we would like to know what does this community want in terms of patent licensing? Um, what are your thoughts on exclusive versus non-exclusive? Should we give it to everybody or, or does it make more sense to give it to just one, one company and have them work on that and then you all work on something else? Um, so we've got these questions. We'd like your input. Um, so I have slides too. Uh, we have an, an activity called Startup NASA. It is a no-cost uh, technology patent license uh, to startup companies, and we're very loose with our definition of startup. So if you're thinking, oh, I've already incorporated, but eh, you're a startup still. It's a no-cost patent license, non-exclusive. You don't pay us anything for the first three years. At the end of um, three years, if you hadn't commercialized, there's a little... Um, quit camping out on our IP uh, p penalty charge that comes in that, that, that we'll negotiate with you. But ultimately, we're trying to get um, technologies out to industry, um, low running royalty rate of about 4% um, if you are commercially successful, but no money. If you're interested in patenting an asset technology, it won't cost you anything if you're a startup company. If you're interested in, in uh, accessing our technologies, we have an online portfolio. It used to be organized by NASA Field Center, but we found that, that it's more useful to tell you what the technology actually is instead of where, instead of where it's from. Uh, so we have categories in here like aeronautics, um, robotics, um, automation, materials, coatings, sensors, instruments, anything you might be interested in, we have it here. Each technology that we have available for you um, has a plain language description, more technical inf information. We list benefits and applications for them, and then there's a link uh, that you can click on for more information. And then there's also, if you're interested in licensing it from us, there's an automated um, TurboTax-esque licensing application system where you go in and you ask a few simple questions and, and at the end of that, you, you resu the result is an a, a application to use that technology. We have evaluation licenses. If you want to just kick the tires and see if you're interested in it, we also have commercial licenses if you'd like a little exclusivity in order to, to compel investment to bring it to market. We also have a software portfolio. NASA has over 1,000 free codes and the reason they're free is the, um, the U.S. government hasn't quite caught up um, with um, uh, software yet. So the US government is not allowed to copyright and we don't patent software. So as a result, the thing that we're able to do is just give it to you. Um, there's over a thousand modern everyday um, uh, codes. These are, um, nothing in this catalog is over five years old. They're organized by um, application type. And these are real tools that our engineers use every day. So over a thousand different uh, uh, software codes, all free. Take a look, uh, it, did I mention it's free? 
Uh, so we've also got the patent licenses, patent, uh, technology.nasa.gov slash patents, software.nasa.gov. Um, we've got the startup activity. And then uh, we also have um, a long history of having developed technologies. All of our public domain technologies are on that same technology.nasa.gov site. And this is close to 7,000 um, older technologies now uh, that we've either determined didn't have um, they're either expired patents or ones that we thought um, made most sense to just make freely available to the public. Um, so 7,000 technologies in here. And the way patents are written is um, uh, enabling information that to allow you to actually use that technology. So there's thousands of technologies available to you, for you. Uh, Technology.nasa.gov. I'll skip that because I'm being told to stop. And then I'll leave you with just with my propaganda slide. I think this is just a cool picture. And I let it sit there for a minute and you all can look at it. Um, so technology.nasa.gov, patents, software, free licensing, and uh, thank you. Great, right, Dan. Thanks. Thank you. All right, good stuff. We're just scratching the surface on these. All right, so Harry Partridge, next up, Chief Technologist of Ames. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here today to welcome you and tell you a little bit about uh, NASA Ames. Uh, if you don't know where NASA Ames is, we're located in Silicon Valley. Uh, let's see if I can figure out the slides. It's the top button. Top button. Uh, so we're located in uh, Silicon uh, Va Valley in Mountain View, California, so not far from San Francisco. Uh, we're near Google, not far from Stanford, four miles or so from the Stanford campus. Um, I think it has the best weather of all the NASA centers, so if you can I come and visit us. Yeah. Um, so a uh, little bit about Ames. Ames was formed uh, quite a while ago, or, uh, before 1940. It was part of NACA, second NASA center. Um, the um, Ames has been involved in innovation for a long time, involved in many missions, and most of the flight missions that NASA has been involved in, we've had a uh, role in. Um, so a picture of Ames, it has the largest wind tunnels um, uh, in the world. It has the arc jets, the NASA arc jets are there. Uh, it has a NASA research park, uh, it has an airfield. So when um, Air Force One lands there, when uh, President's in, in California, in that part of California, um, Google has now leased a good portion of parts of this. And so what I wanted then to uh, talk about then is Ames has eight core competencies, and these are the areas that we do research in that uh, we're known for. So air traffic control, if you flew here uh, the, on an airplane, uh, the air traffic control system, a lot of the software, the ground control software was actually written at Ames. Uh, the entry systems, uh, the TPS systems uh, get developed. Uh, um, so heat is, for instance, is a recent example of that. It's a, a high-performance uh, thermal uh, protection system. Uh, the advanced computing systems and IT systems for, for NASA, we run the supercomputers for NASA. It has a D-Wave quantum computer that uh, is available for you, and that's a uh, collaboration between Google, NASA, and USRA. Uh, we do intelligent adaptive systems, so autonomy, robotics, um, uh, there's some really interesting projects in there. Uh, cost effective space missions. Uh, we started off originally doing CubeSats, but we push uh, missions that we can do fairly cheaply uh, in pushing the science. Uh, aerosciences, uh, we do a lot of uh, traditional aerosciences. Uh, uh, calibration, for instance, for the Mars helicopter. Uh, astrobiology and life sciences, we do a lot of work in life detection. Uh, the, the Astrobiology Institute uh, is there. It's uh, light, uh, planetary sciences are so there, earth sciences. Um, instrument development, again, for life detection is very important at Ames. A lot of the rodent research is managed out of, out of there, a lot of flight experiments. And then space and earth sciences. And so, for instance, the Kepler mission was um, uh, conceived and managed out of, uh, out of uh, Ames. We also have the facilities to, to, um, to support these activities. In the largest wind tunnel, the arc jets, where you can test your thermal protection systems, uh, computers, uh, simulators, um, and the range complex are some of the activities. And thank you very much. And if you're ever in the Bay Area, we welcome you to come and visit Ames. Thank you. Thank you, Harry.
All right, next up we will hear again from Clayton Turner, who's going to tell us a little bit about Langley. All right, so you heard uh, a lot from me, probably more than the organizers planned on hearing from me uh, this morning. But so I want to I want to take a little uh, spin a little differently, and I want to spin off something Dan Lockney was talking about. You've heard already about a lot of technologies, and I can go down a list of those at Langley. I'm going to play a video for you uh, when I get done. But what I want you to take from all four of us is that it's not a geographical location for the things we have to offer and partner with. Reach out to any of us, and we will connect you to the place that you should be getting that technology, either for transfer or if you want to have that first talk about how do we do this kind of thing. So you've heard a sampling of what we do at some of the research centers, but you also have a similar sampling of things at Johnson Space Flight Center and Kennedy and Goddard and, and JPL. So if you take nothing else, come to the mixer this afternoon or the social event at 315 and have a conversation with us so we can tell you how you make that connection. And as was said earlier, uh, we're not always going to get it right. We maybe aren't really good at moving at the pace of business, but we are determined to get really good at moving at the pace of business. So I encourage you to come and join us. So with that, I'm going to play the video before they give me the stop sign. How do you nurture an idea or shape it to solve problems, create opportunity, and open doors to a better life for all? First, find its strengths, discover its limits, refine it, test it, and repeat. At NASA's Langley Research Center, we strive to discover, distill, and connect great ideas, then channel them into solutions, leading to a brighter future. With vision and determination, we look beyond what's possible today and strive to make tomorrow a better place. An idea could be as small as a few lines of code, or as big as a revolutionary way to travel. It could be a system for building in the vacuum of space, or a laser that helps explorers land safely on the moon. We're on a quest to discover trailblazing ideas and transformative tools. We build, measure, and explore. We accelerate technologies and connect concepts along with the people who envision them. Together with our partners, we push for deeper understanding and search for innovations that will benefit everyone. Breakthroughs that improve how we fly, how we see the earth, and how we explore the universe. Our work will spread global goodwill, improve lives, and protect our planet. A great leap starts with just one idea. NASA Langley, where great ideas take flight. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys for the overviews. And I, I'm glad Clayton made the point about all the different technologies really spread throughout the agency. because. You may be hearing from just a handful of us up here, but we represent one NASA. And so there may be a technology that you guys are looking for. I'll use one for an example. Somebody was uh, asking a, a nuclear power question earlier at lunch, right? And, and the person you reach out to may not know the answer, but we can certainly connect you to the person within the agency that can do it. So we just scratched the surface on all these technologies that exist. We could be up here for two days talking everything across the agency. But again, that gives you guys a little bit more insight. So now switching to a little bit more about partnerships and how we can make ourselves more accessible to you guys, I'm going to go ahead and run through some questions with them. And we'll let them share a little bit of their insight on these questions. And then we're going to go ahead and open it up to the audience on Q&A. So we're going to first up is going to be Marla. So Marla, I know with NASA, uh, you know, Dan had made a point earlier, uh, a good one in the sense that if we would have been having these conversations 15, 20 years ago, this new space community didn't exist. It was, it was just beginning. And now we have a lot of folks out there that we can leverage for this type of technology. We can collaborate that can really propel technologies that we want to advance. So with that, what are the most critical changes at NASA that you think that we need to make in order to face the future to become more collaborative and more effective? 
So I think um, we have the mechanism. It's about creativity, flexibility, and speed. Speed is going to be important. Um, it's important to you, it's important to us in terms of you know, how we develop the technology, how we transfer the technology, and many times is the partnership what really provide that speed. Because you may have an application that's different from us, but we get data and we get better in terms of understanding how that technology can be used and is being used. So I think it's a partnership that you know, um, expand the, uh, the advancement of the technology, but the understanding of the technology as well. So I think you know, finding ways to do that, like you know, coming here, talking to all of you about the different mechanism that we have is important. Because it doesn't matter how many of these licenses we have, how many of these processes we have, if we don't have a, you know, a place or some kind of venue that we can talk to you about what it is, where you can go, uh, what kind of things are available. So I think you know, that creativity, that innovation, and that speed is critical. So I think those are the changes. And then in terms of the you know, um, processes or the mechanism of the tools that we have, um, Dan, you mentioned about this, is in terms of you know, streamline. You know, there's certain times that we have processes that are too long, so help us understand, you know, what are those areas that we have to improve. I think that's also the part of the process that it will be great to, um, you know, get some, some feedback from, from all of you. Good, good, and, and I'm, I'm glad you said that because that feedback is really important for us because we don't know what we don't know. So instead of you guys getting frustrated um, at the way that we're doing business or the way our procurement process or something like that is working, Give us that feedback, because that's how we improve. So I'm glad that you pointed that out. Thank you, Marla. Um, all right, so Dan, um, Artemis. So Artemis missions are kicking off right now. Um, at, will NASA continue to revise their policies in terms of collaborating with these out, outside partners as far as technology development transfer uh, towards a mutual benefit for all of us? I panicked for a second, because I forgot that you were going to ask me that question. Um, <laughs> What? Um, I like putting you on so, the spot, Dan. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually I'm mission agnostic can, uh, in tech transfers. Like whatever the agency is going to do is exciting because new technology will come out of it, and then we'll find ways to get it out to industry. So you want to go where? Okay, make new stuff. And so with Artemis stuff, that's not I don't know. Um, the question is, will we continue to revise our policies? I hope so. And again, I, that um, hand I put on the tables is is an open call to how could we get better in tech transfer. Um, and to piggyback on something Marla said about, and, and what you were saying about how to um, uh, revise our policies, it is, yes, tell us. I think we also, it's, it's a responsibility of, of NASA and all of us to take a look at what we're doing and use some common sense. Um, so and NASA is very open to and um, we want to be better and faster and to look more like, work more like industry. And I know we keep asking you, what can we do differently? What can we do differently? I also think that, that we are looking, everywhere I go, I see people within the agency looking at our own processes. But it, it's difficult. It's like when you move into a new house and you start unpacking things and, and things kind of end up where you put them initially, like five years later. Like I never intended for this to be here, but, but it, just, it just sat there and it stayed. Um, and then you get, you get used to it. And it takes um, us looking at our, our work with fresh eyes and realizing that you know, that's, that's not the best place for the dresser. It blocks the vent it's, to keep that metaphor going. Um, but we can, we can look at our own processes. We can look at how we interact. Um, uh, one of the themes that we've, we've been pulling at today is to, to start acting less like 10 independent field centers and more like one NASA. Um, and we've seen um, standardization across our um, Space Act agreements, across our patent licensing, across our software usage agreements. Uh, we have communities of practice that meet with all 10 field centers to try to figure out um, how to make it so that when you come to NASA, regardless of where you interact, you have the same experience. And then that, that's step number one. And then step number two is to make sure that that experience is good. Um, and again, that answer was not specific to Artemis, but I think that's true regardless of what we're going to do. We're trying to get better for you guys. Yep, yep, indeed, and, and thank you for pointing that out too with the Artemis. So even though that seems to be all of the focus now, because that is a, a mandate that we are embracing as an agency, and it is all hands on deck for us to do that, we still have tons of portfolios elsewhere, whether it's in our science mission director, whether it's our aeronautics. And even though you guys are the new space community, a lot of these capabilities and technologies are cross-cutting. So those applications really go across all of our portfolio. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. Um, all right, Harry, so I'm going to kind of give you a, a scenario here where uh, as a new space company, 
um, you happen to have a technology that they can benefit from or could collaborate on, what, what would you be your advice to give them on their first steps on how to engage with you into a form of collaboration? So if you have a, have a technology that you know uh, that you want to, uh, to, to license or something like that, you should definitely start with the uh, partnerships office. Uh, they, they do the agreements, they can draft them, they accelerate them getting through the system. Um, I mean, that's just the, the natural place to, to start off with. Um, if you think you have know what you want or you're not certain about it, you can still start with the partnerships office. They can then put you in contact with people. Um, all the centers, though, also have a chief technologist. You can contact them. They can help uh, guide you. Uh, eventually, you'll end up back at the partnership office, but they can give you some of the information you need to, get, to, get, to go on. Um, if you don't know um, something and you want to know something about, well, how NASA uses it, what the NASA requirements are, uh, again, you can go through the partnerships office or the chief technologist. And I mean, I get ca these calls quite often, and I f forward them to other researchers so they actually can get details of what we're looking for, what we need. And the other thing that uh, we can do in, in this is say that you have a technology that you think NASA would be interested in. Um, uh, you can, we're also interested in those technologies and I, I meet with quite a few companies and go find out what they're doing and what and how we would use those. Uh, NASA iTech is an example of that where um, we have problems or, and if companies have technologies they think NASA's interested in, um, and then frequently we pass them on to make, you know, help make contacts with NASA to explore those technologies. Great, thanks Harry. And the, the partnership offices that he refers to are, we have one of those at each one of our centers and then also at headquarters. Uh, so all that information is online and in fact there's material within the bags that kind of give you contact info. But to take that a step further, we have a good chunk of NASA people here that are from those partnership offices that will be staffing the networking session. So we can take that a step further and you guys can actually meet them. So let's say that you can't have any luck with any of those, then we had said earlier, you guys can call any of us, right? Because what we kind of want to do, again, is make it accessible. We want to be that connector. If you guys don't have luck getting with those, then you guys can get with any NASA person that you've met and we can see if we can connect you to the right person. All right, so Clayton. Your last up and um, kind of twofold question. So, what kind of opportunities uh, exist to increase collaboration in the realm of space technology or beyond? And how do you think NASA is adapting to the external commercial space market? So, so I think there's a, a wide range of ways we can collaborate. Uh, broad area announcements, uh, commercialization programs, uh, Space Act agreements. Those are some of the formal methods. But uh, probably can't stress enough, uh, Harry, Dan, and Marla have all hit this. Pick up the phone and call us. We have, I had a conversation with somebody after this morning's talk, and he was asking me some questions, and I said, you need to talk to Marisol Garcia. So if you're in here, Marisol's right there in the red jacket. <laughs> all right, so that's your first entry point. And, and when you talk to Marisol, it's not just about what's going on at Langley. Marisol is connected to the network that can get you to those other technologies. So while there are many formal ways to go about it, uh, the first thing is that conversation. The other thing I'll say is you tend to see the face of the technologies either through folks like us or the subject matter experts, but there's also uh, folks in our procurement office, our legal office. They are also looking for ways to say yes if. There's gonna be some requirements, some things by law that we have to do, but beyond that, we're going to try to be as flexible as we can, and they will be trying to find that way, yes, if. And as many on the panel have already said, to do that at the pace of business. Thank you. Thank you, Clayton. And, and having pointed out Marisol, so not to call you out again, but um, I know we have folks setting up for the networking session upstairs, but if we don't mind, can I have a show of hands of our NASA partnership people that may be in the room, just so folks can actually see? Okay, we've got a couple in the back. Okay, we've got more here, but they're setting up um, some in the back too. Um, uh, upstairs at the Lake Washington room for after this that you guys connect with. Um, all right, well, I wanted to go ahead and open up to the audience and take questions and answers from you guys, either on partnership type of uh, activities um, or also on any of the technologies you may have seen. Over here. So what's the best way to access 
NASA data from ongoing missions, science data? So, so I can certainly from an Earth science standpoint and from a science in general, there are data centers across the country that you can sign up for subscriptions on to get to that data, if that's what you're talking about. Is that? Yeah, we've got eight DACs. Um, yeah. it's, I believe it's eight now. Maybe it's mm -hmm. nine um, uh, data centers uh, in which all of that data uh, is downlinked to. And I believe that there is a rule 72 hours within collection that we've got to post it to the public. So like he had said, you can access those data centers, go to their websites, uh, sign up and get that subscription, and then you have access to that data. Good. Uh, Universities are attending or starting to trend towards privatizing their sort of uh, projects that are coming out of their labs um, and licensing. And venture capital and other equity are starting to encroach on early space development stuff. Uh, are these guys starting to compete with you? Or if not, where do you see your role uh, in the sort of evolving ecosystem of private capital, universities being more private, and then you guys? So I see it more as a partnership. Um, it's not necessarily competition. Yeah, there are some areas that you know you could see some competition, but it's really the partnership. That's why, you know, when we have um, like right now Artemis and all those activities is open to universities, private entity, um, to be part of the solution. There's different calls by the mission directorates in science, in aeronautics, and you know, in space that really ask for ideas in terms of technology. We also have a responsibility when we partner. Um, if there's IP data, we have a responsibility to negotiate that and make sure we protect the IP data of you know, the company. Now, if it's government and the government is putting the money, then we have also a responsibility to share that with you know, a, the public. So that's kind of the negotiations, and every case is you know, case by case, so you really have to sit down and talk about that. We do have great partnership with universities, um, and we really like their talent because you know a lot of time we look at the problem, and we have been looking at that problem for too long, so we cannot see more than what we have been trying. And then we bring some um, of this group from universities, and they come out with brilliant ideas, things that we didn't talk about because they haven't been you know working the same thing over and over. So I think that's you know one of the yeah, big advantages. Yeah, and I would agree that that diversity of thought um, that academia and the private space commercial sector can bring for us is incredibly important because we are very guilty of, as I always say, of inhaling our own exhaust. So we sit around and, and talk about the same thing with the same people. So kind of bringing in that diversity is really important to us to getting those other ideas. Uh, that another point too is I think with the competition sometimes or when we see folks doing something that's similar to us, I, you know, we're stewards of the taxpayer's money. And so for us, we are constantly having to make make-buy decisions. And, and if we see something in private industry, in fact, I've been witness to this multiple times where we saw something developing in private industry, it makes more sense for us to stand down and invest and work with that company and allow them to develop it and for us to buy that from them instead of us making it. So we constantly are going through make-buy decisions with our technologies and our capabilities. It's an evolving process for us. Quick question. Uh, NASA has a, a wide array of uh, test facilities, which are fantastic. I wonder if NASA has any programs specifically directed to small companies that allows them access to those facilities, uh, again, specific to testing. Like the DOE voucher program? Is that what you're referring to? Are you familiar? We don't have something like that, so I shouldn't even mention that. Well, we do have the, we do have the new funding. We Check do have DOE. The, they got this great voucher program. We do have the new oh. funding model. Um, and so I, I, Clayton and Marla can expand on that also. But uh, that was started up, I believe, about three years ago. And it's our core, some of our core research facilities and some of our larger wind tunnels. And as long as you are doing work within the portfolio that benefits NASA and whatever your business is, there's a shared cost on that, and your test time within these research facilities is actually comped. So it's free. You would need to bring in, of course, your labor. Um, and it's called the new funding model, and that's something that we started in order to um, really propel R&D. 
because we were finding that using our research facilities are, is cost prohibitive. I mean, it, it, somebody couldn't come in and, and use our National Transonic Facility where it uses liquid nitrogen in order to drive the Reynolds number by lowering temperature, and all of a sudden it's, it's you know, it's what, $20,000 a, a test hour, right? That's, that's cost prohibitive. So we do have this new funding model, and, and Marlon Clayton and, yeah, and other guess, folks, I'll let you expand on I that. I guess not to be the rainer on the parade, uh, you can't come in and use a facility if there's outside industry doing it because we wouldn't want to compete with them. The idea, as Debbie said, is where we have common interests mm -hmm. and so there's an advantage to NASA to do the test that you also want to do and we're not competing with an outside entity. And then there's benefit for us because then it'd be more sharing data because we both get data or IP on the other end of that. So just to add that caveat. Yeah, and that's one of the mechanisms, like space out agreements. That's what you usually start with because we have to negotiate, you know, who brings what and what is the benefit to NASA. I think that's the critical part. What is the benefit to NASA when we get in this kind of um, agreement? Um, but, you know, we, we talk about the wind tunnels, but there's also some specific equipment that is at NASA or test rig that we can also get into the, uh, you know, um, space out agreements, for example, for coatings. Um, there's maybe some type of coding that NASA is also working, so that uh, partnership will get us data that we didn't have. So we can also get into space out agreements where we look into that kind of uh, data. So it's not just the wind tunnels. Um, we have multiple facilities, multiple um, test equipment, things that we have under each one of the centers. Um, they, they, again, we go back to the beginning, right? Case by case, have a conversation with someone at NASA, explain what you're trying to do, and then we can direct you to the right place. So w within the year, we'll have on technology.nasa.gov, um, what we're hoping is a comprehensive inventory of all of the available test facilities. Um, and the, the idea is to have um, photographs of the, the buildings, the facilities, the, the, the cap and then list of the capabilities, a uh, technical point of contact, and a business contact. That's a, a, a need we saw. Um, so it's still a couple months out before we have that, but we will be publishing that on, our, on an agency level website. So if you're interested in there's a, uh, something you'd like to use, you'll be able to dig through our catalog and see what we've got. But so we know, we know you need that, we're making it. Two questions, one incredibly specific, another maybe of more general interest. Uh, the first one is, is there a software code available that will predict the decay of satellites above 500 kilometers? And the second is, um, under what circumstances is, uh, can NASA derived um, technology that you're using have a NASA logo on it, or have a NASA <laughs> logo in the marketing op uh, operation? So the answer to the first question is, we have a ton of software codes on the, on the catalog. Take a look, software.nasa.gov. Um, if you don't find exactly what you're looking for, you might find something else. And again, it's free. Um, so I don't know this, the answer to your specific first question, but I would definitely, everyone should take a look. It's free. Um, it's not just free to look, it's free to access the code. And then second, that's something we've actually been running into. Um, it's been a, an age old issue for us that the most powerful brand um, uh, that we have to offer is that you know, the NASA Blue Meatball, um, and, and currently we're not able to um, let licensees or partners use it. Although there is, there are there are active conversations at headquarters now to either um, uh, let us use some modified um, uh, service mark uh, that a company could put on a product or their website and say, yes, I have a NASA grant. Yes, I have a NASA SBIR. Yes, I'm, this is a an official licensee of NASA Technologies. Whether or not it's the meatball, we're still negotiating that. Um, but it's something that every couple of years we run that through the Office of Government Ethics and ask them for permission. But, but the current administration is, is a big advocate of, of taking better advantage of that, that blue meatball logo. But yeah, right now you can't. Um, thank you. So uh, you've expressed uh, several instances of collaboration between uh, NASA and the private sector, right? But um, opening it up to actual commerce and industry and, you know, and, and the, the private sector is going to, I imagine, take, you know, certain steps. What is your position on the commercialization of space? So we're all for it. It's cool. Everyone benefits. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, 
And you can elaborate. I'm not sure how specific you want to be, but uh, we have talked, and I talked this morning. Every time private industry takes on its, I go back to my aviation model, and you know, companies build airplanes, and we buy tickets. We are all for it because it enables us to go out further to that next step. So commercialization, uh, driving the economy, those are all good things. Those are in our charter as a, as a NASA entity from 19. Uh, 658, sorry. In terms of? Open doors to the commercialization space. Yeah, private industry. Well, so I would say private industry is going to do that whether we are enabling it, dragging our feet, fighting it, or running out in front of it. So that's going to happen because of some of the talks we heard that aren't NASA talks. The, as the business cases begin to close, that's the next step, you know, the industrial revolution, uh, the IT revolution, and now it's space. So those things are going to happen. So it's not a NASA must control the gate of. Uh, I took your question as, are we supportive of such a thing? So yes, we are. Yeah, but we don't get to control the gate. That's mm -hmm. going to go But we, we enable it, though, with yes. the, the development of the technologies that allow that. So the commercialization, that absolutely. So I, you know, what we envision is a whole ecosystem in space, right? We want a sustained human presence in space, and that is even beyond the moon. And, and what are those technologies that we need to be working on now with y'all's help to enable that and to push that forward, right? So it's an enabling role. I, I, I think of a, a technology, and I don't want to digress too much because my colleagues will have to drag me off the stage, but an emerging one is, is OSAM, so that's on-orbit servicing assembly and manufacturing. So I want you to envision everything that we have here terrestrial. Right, whether we're, we're new buildings going up everywhere, the way that we operate, being able to go to a Starbucks, this and that. We want that whole ecosystem developed ultimately long term in space that we can enable our human presence. And how do we do that? We need to be able to have the tools and the capabilities to be able to assemble things up there, to manufacture, to construct things. We need to be able to service them. We had the question about a, a satellite degradation at the high altitude. So, well, what if I could tell you we're, we're going to have the technology we can actually go up there and fix that and repair it and service it, and that we don't have to just lose and have more orbital debris. So, again, these are all, I'm just scratching the surface on technologies that are newly emergent, that we're advancing to enable what we see as a whole ecosystem and a whole sustained human presence in space, even beyond the moon. So you mentioned ecosystems, which is a good lead into this question. So there's a lot of companies out there and they're each selecting their own independent kind of vertical, whether that be power, uh, transportation, habitation, life support. And I think what it takes is a group of people to come together to make what I would call an industrial park. You know, an area where you can have um, a place to test interoperability, to test does my gizmo work with your gadget, and that would be, I guess, um, a lead in. Is there, is there anything in, in your minds that would be like that? Let's say there's a, a moon uh, industrial park and a Mars industrial park somewhere, or is that maybe something, maybe I can give you some food for thought for the future? Sounds like a pain so, so I, I, I okay, well, so I'm gonna let Harry take this, but if you think about CLIPS, the commercial lunar payload, does my thing work with your thing in this environment? You can think of that as a version of that. And there's ground testing that we do here. Does, does thing A work with thing B, and, and how does that work in an environment we can simulate? So formal program, I, I don't know beyond you know, clips that I described, but those activities go on all the time because it does get to systems of systems. And as we talk about that economy, it's not going to be any one thing that goes up there. It's going to be many things playing and working well together. So I don't know if Harry you want to add. Um, so for analog systems, there are, um, I mean, NASA has systems that it uses for testing things, and sometimes those are available, but there are also universities that are creating uh, analog systems. So think of Boulder uh, is, is working on an analog system. There are other universities that, that are doing that. But I mean, NASA has a set that it uses for testing um, and where we go and test them. And, and that information, uh, sometimes we try to make that available. I don't know that it's a central location, but there are things about how we do that. Uh, and so those can be made available. Uh, I guess I'll just follow up with it. It'd be really cool if you could uh, have a site, say, in the desert somewhere where you 
uh, terrestrially to test out a lot of technologies. I don't know if that falls under any of your of your work scopes, but that would be pretty cool. Yeah. So, so one of the um I mean, it's, it's a cool idea. One of the difficulties is when we think about, like, for example, Mars. How you can simulate the right environment. Th that's where the difficulty comes, because you still have to simulate the gravity. It may be you're able to test in terms of the dust. There are certain conditions that, by, you know, by all means, you can replicate. But when it gets a little bit more complicated is when we start talking about the gravity. Uh, when we talk, start talking about the, uh, the composition of the atmosphere out there. Those kind of things you can test, but then you really have to rely on subcomponents, and there's still always the question about when you put everything together, how that's going to work. So that's why going back to the moon, we're so excited about that, because that enabled us to test and really, really test some of the technologies that we're going to need to improve and also that we need to develop at a different stage to go to Mars. So I think, you know, that's that's the big test, how we can create that kind of environment. We, we have been very successful with other. Um, I talk about you know, what we're doing in Plumbrook, for example, that we can test certain conditions in terms of space launch. You know, the thermal, uh, the electromagnetic, certain things, but we cannot test every single thing, like, for example, if we're talking about the power system on the moon. Um, yes, we can do certain things at a you know, small scale, but the whole system, we really have to go there, and that's what we are so excited, being able to be there and really test some of these technologies. But great idea, you know, great yeah. idea. So I'd like to second the importance of the comments on a uh, uh, industrial park, not only here as an analog, but actually in space. And what we have not heard from NASA is what is your plan, what is your vision for a lunar industrial facility? How are you going to shape that and set goals to structure that market? It's very exciting to hear what you guys are doing with CLPS and COTS and CRS, but there's a much broader thing. And when, you know, I, I'm glad to hear on the one hand uh, that yes, you recognize that all that is part of your charter, but on the other hand, we keep hearing, yeah, but we're gonna get back to the edge. Well, for, for this community, that industrialization, that SRU, that is the edge. And we're not seeing the, the kind of work that we expect from NASA. There's nothing like a decadal study to help move that industrial section forward. And I think the president's position in the SPD is very clear that NASA is supposed to lead that conversation. And so far, I, I just don't see that part of the conversation being led. So I, I'm going to take a swing at what I think is a, the, the question there. So there, there are areas that NASA is going to lead and drive, but we are not going to drive the full e economy. So that, that, that thing that you're envisioning in the future, there will be places that we will fill in some of the gaps and private entities will fill in some of the other gaps. Uh, I'm not sure I can give you a better response. I invite anybody else to So I actually would, yeah. would support having a decadal survey on, on lunar exploration. I think that would be really interesting. Um, going back to the moon, I think that there, we are planned to be there in 2024. Uh, sustainability, I think, is more of a challenge, and a lot of it is the lunar sciences that is going to happen and these missions in the 20, 21, 22, 23 that will help guide where that's going. Um, I mean, we know some of the challenges that are going to be there. We know some of the technologies we need. Um, and, you know, I mean, there were detailed roadmaps for lunar, uh, for Mars exploration, but some of those don't translate back to the lunar systems. Uh, I was determined not to take questions during the NASA panel since I am NASA, but I'm also old enough not to care if I get in any trouble. Uh-oh. So, uh, <laughs> this is not a good start. <laughs> and There's that wraps up our panel. I'm Just sorry, kidding. But Carry on. With a fundamental misunderstanding stated earlier, and uh, so I wanted to, to get over. When the uh, a, a good question was asked about uh, since, as, uh, as Dan stated, uh, NASA recognizes that uh, new companies have trouble getting started, and a good example to try to help them was uh, New Start licensing, give them a couple of years free to, to make use of things. Well, why don't we have something related to that for facilities? And it turns out we really don't. Uh, Marla happened to mention that, uh, and in Marla's defense, every single NASA uh, official states the exact same thing Marla does. 
<laughs> that whenever we negotiate things like Space Act agreements, we always have to look at things like uh, in the negotiations that, well, what's in this for NASA too? When it comes to commercial space development, that's not entirely accurate as the saying goes, because it is not, has not caught up with the change that happened in the last couple of years in the law. In the last couple of years, the Space Act, the founding law of NASA, was updated. And the development of commercial space was made officially in law one of NASA's founding missions. Okay? It is not an also ran. It is not if we have some time, it is not if there's a few spare, spare minutes or if the facility is standing idle. It is one of our missions. And so I would maintain that if uh, a company comes up to us and actually has something that can make a dip, potentially make a difference in terms of commercial space development, whether or not it has something to do with an internal approved NASA mission already existing is kind of irrelevant. The issue is, since commercial space development is a mission of NASA itself legally, something we continue to ignore even though a couple of years ago it became part of law, we now are obligated to consider that all by itself. And I have not run into one single NASA official who's paid attention to that little thing called the change in law yet. And we need to start paying attention to that. Now, the rest of the community here knows about that change in law. And that's part where part of the frustration comes, is that it is in the Space Act now. That it is a part of law that NASA is to support commercial space development, period. Uh, I really do think, Dan, in terms of things like, and this is, Doug Comstock's in the room, right? <laughs> Hi, boss. How you doing? Been a while. <laughs> I, for those who don't know, I used to work for Dan when I was at NASA headquarters. Uh, I mean, uh, but, uh, uh, Doug, uh, but uh, uh, he's done an excellent uh, job, in my opinion, on the recent rollout of the uh, Low Earth Orbit uh, Commercialization Plan. I, he really does, has. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about it. But uh, 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 we really need to be more serious about the incorporation of uh, uh, commercial space into law as something that, uh, uh, when we look at these Space Act agreements, is something that is not an also ran and only if it's convenient, and to take it as a serious mission of NASA. Uh, and, uh, and not just look and see if there are already existing missions in NASA that things can support. And if there aren't, well, sorry, you, you're not doing anything for us. The commercial space community does not exist to support NASA as an agency. We exist in part to support them. Just like NASA, NACA existed to support the aircraft industry before. So if I and the speech. So we're, we're getting the stop sign, but I would welcome maybe at the after session to have a follow-on conversation for those that were interested, because I would contend we are doing some of those things. I would agree. In fact, there's yep. some things that are being driven that aren't in our mission portfolio. The challenge is we, NASA, with this budget, can't be all things to all people. So who gets to pick company A versus company B? Because I'm guessing if I pick company B, company A may have a little energy behind that. So I would say we are doing some of those exact things. And because we're getting the stop sign, I welcome a follow-on conversation down at the social mixer. And so for all is it one I would just that. add also, I also worked for Doug. He's a, mm -hmm. a good dude. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I agree with Clayton, too. So let's, let's take this offline, because I want to make sure we understand a little bit better. Because I speaking from my optic personally, um, I run our space technology and exploration directorate at Langley. And, I have never known a world where we haven't embraced commercial space. So, so your words are actually a little confusing to me because we embrace that. We are, we are out, in fact, that's why we're sitting here, um, is to actually embrace that. And so if we're getting that wrong, right, or there's a projection of, of where we need to get better, then I think that's great feedback for us. And, and I think, you know, we go back to the first statement that we make. Sitting down and talking about case by case is the important piece. 
because we take this very seriously. You know, we will not be here. It, it is part of our mission. It is part yes. of the mission. Yep. So I think, you know, that's, that's the beauty. The beauty is sitting down, let's talk case by case. Okay, so I think we have gotten the stop sign Stop. three times already. <laughs> so let's thank our panelists. Thank you.